I have my own special pointer today because we're going to see some movies. So the title of my grant is An Active Investigation of Prion Inactivation by Reactive Oxygen Species in Vivo. But more simply, you can think of this as can prions be stopped by a disinfectant that's naturally produced by the immune system? So your body contains millions of proteins, and these proteins are essential to keep your cells healthy and operational. Um, and, and to carry out these functions, they need to be very correctly assembled into specific structures or their normal structures. And the body has multiple ways to ensure that this takes place. However, these quality control checks on protein folding can and do fail. And when they fail, you can get reorganization of these proteins or misfolding of these proteins in multiple different ways. Some become disorganized clumps of proteins, and others go on um, to form these very highly structured uh, proteins that can go on to be assembled into those rod-like structures you see there on the right. Now, in the case of prion disease, these go on to accumulate in the tissues of um, an infected host. And so you can see the prion plaques there in green. And they're surrounded um, in uh, red, uh, denoting the support cells there surrounding the prion plaque. And so this is a brain slice from an animal that has clinical prion disease. So how does a misfolded protein become an infectious agent um, with the ability to amplify itself in the body? So in the case of prions, that misfolded protein is able to bind to the normally folded protein um, that everybody expresses in their body, normally folded PRP. And it's able to corrupt its structure uh, such that the normal protein changes to look exactly like the infectious prions. And this process takes place again and again so that you have elongation of those highly organized misfolded assemblies. And what you're looking at uh, down on the bottom there is a super high magnification picture of an actual prion fibril. And just for context on scale, the length of the bar on the bottom there is one one thousandth the width of a human hair. But ultimately, even though brands are infectious, for them to actually cause disease, you need to have a process where the ability to form the prions, the ability for those prions to accumulate, outpaces any ways the body has to get rid of it. And in the case of prion formation and accumulation, we know that there's several factors that can accelerate this process. This includes genetic mutations in PRP, um, some cofactors that we're aware of. But when it comes to ways that we can get rid of prions from the body, um, it's largely not understood how this, uh, if the body can clear prions, and if it can, how this takes place. So how does your body deal with any infectious agents? Well, you have multiple layers of defense, and this includes your immune system. And so your immune system is very quickly activated when it senses an infectious agent, like a bacteria or a virus. And when these immune cells see this infectious agent, they produce compounds known as reactive oxygen species, or ROS. And these are really natural disinfectants that the immune cells um, produce in order to kill that invader. And so uh, the schematic there on the bottom is a, a, a picture of a neutrophil cell, which is a white blood, uh, blood cell, and it's really your immune system's first responder. And so if you can imagine uh, those little red blobs on the outside of the cell, if that's your infectious agent, the neutrophil is able to recognize that, become activated, and produce these ROS disinfectants to kill that invader. Now, these ROS species include a, a compound known as hypochlorous acid, which is a highly potent antimicrobial 
due to its uh, high reactivity with any number of biomolecules. Now, the central theme of my grant really looks at how these immune system mechanisms may deal with a prion infection in the body. But first, how do I detect prions um, in a laboratory environment? And so I use an assay known as the real-time quaking-induced conversion, or RT-quick assay. And this is based on the premise um, I described earlier, where we can take infectious prions and we can mix them with the normally folded PRP protein and their ability to convert the structure of the normal PRP can be measured very specifically with a dye. And you can see that the increase of the line tells us how many of prions um, were in the initial sample. Now, the RT-Quick is currently being used uh, for real human and animal diagnostics, but it's also a very powerful research tool that allows me to very sensitively uh, follow prions as they move through the body. Um, in response to different experimental conditions. Oh dear. So I, I first became interested in this process when we were approached by a company known as BrioTech to test a novel disinfectant for its activity against prions. Um, and so why were we interested in testing a novel disinfectant to begin with? Well, prions are really a robust pathogen. And while this does not pose um, a risk for casual transmission human to human, as Bob touched on, there really is a need for harsh de decontamination protocols in surgical and laboratory settings. And it's really beneficial then to have a less toxic and caustic disinfectant such that it doesn't pose a hazard to the user. So BrioTech formulates these hypochlorous acid solutions um, and they brought these to us to test them for their uh, efficiency in decontaminating prions. The benefit of these solutions is that it, they can be applied directly to the skin um, and the CEO of the company famously likes to spray it on his skin or stand in buckets of this to illustrate really how non-toxic it is. Um, it, it, not a caustic disinfectant. As an additional bonus, um, it's environmentally friendly. And so a couple years ago, we published a study where we showed that when we treat prions with these hypochlorous acid solutions as a disinfectant, we totally eliminated the ability of prions to cause disease in mice. And as other correlates, we used RT-Quick to confirm uh, that these prions were no longer able to amplify themselves, as well um, as uh, those lines on a gel matrix there on the bottom is, is a general measure of how the prions are assembled. And so you can see with no treatment, you have those black lines, which are um, prions. But when they were treated with Brio HLCL, you see that that assembly of the prions is totally changed. And this correlates to its drop in infectivity in the animals. And so uh, thinking about what a potent disinfectant these hypochlorous acid solutions were, and considering that they are produced naturally in your body in response to infection, I began to consider, well, could hypochlorous acid uh, production by the immune system possibly manage a prion infection? And so first, does the immune system actually even respond to a prion exposure? And to look at this, what I did was take actual human neutrophils. So we have donors on campus, they donate a, a vial of blood and we are able then to separate out uh, these immune cells. Again, these are your body's first responders. I can put those in a dish and I can add prions to the dish to ask, well, do these prions activate these immune cells? And when the cells are activated, again, they produce these natural disinfectants. So when they produce these natural disinfectants, what happens to the prions? And what I saw is that, yes, prions in the dish with these human neutrophils are able to activate the cells. And when they activate the cells, the cells produce uh, these Ross disinfectants. And so you can see um, there on the left, when I take these cells and I add a chemical raw stimulator, that red line going up shows that I get an increase in, in the production of those natural disinfectants compared to the blue line where the neutrophils are untreated. And this looks very similar uh, to what happens when I add prions to this dish and I get activation 
of these neutrophils and production of these ROS disinfectants. Now, what are the neutrophils actually doing with these prions? So what you're looking at in this movie, the prions are, are the red dots, and neutrophils are highly mobile cells consistent with their ability um, uh, to come and deal with infection. And so you can see them moving through the dish, and they come and they grab those red prion particles. They pick them up. In some contexts, they appear to drag them along. And in others, they really seem to be sitting on it. Um, and possibly taking up these prions. And this all happens uh, within mere minutes in this uh, scenario. So from a movie, it's really hard for us to tell what the neutrophils are actually doing with those prions. And so what you're looking at here is a higher magnification picture, a still image. Um, and so the outside of the cell is colored there in green. The prions in this case um, are labeled there in purple. And so uh, on the left is a bird's eye view of that cell. You can see the outside of the cell, green, prions, and purple. And if we move over to the right, that's a side view. So the white line, um, very difficult for me to point. So the, the white line there is the bottom of the cell um, with the cell surface there in green. And what you can see is that purple particle, those purple prions are inside the cell. So these neutrophils in the dish within minutes are coming to pick up the prions and they're ingesting these prions. And we know that this is going to expose them to very concentrated levels of those natural disinfectants. Well, what happens when I change the ability of these neutrophils to produce these natural uh, ROS disinfectants? Oh dear, <laughs> my apologies. Okay. So I have uh, chemicals in the lab that I can treat these neutrophils and this will allow, uh, the chemicals will either inhibit the production of these natural disinfectants or they'll really promote um, the production of these raw uh, disinfectants. And I can take these neutrophil populations, look at them in a dish with prions to see how different levels of this natural disinfectant production influences um, the outcome on prions. And so what I found is that neutrophils that were better at producing ROS disinfectants were better able uh, to change the prions and the, the way we know uh, correlates to reduced infectivity. So along the bottom, you can see ROS production, low, medium, and high. And again, what you can see as that ROS production gets higher, we have a more significant change in that laddering pattern, which is the prions. Um, and I'll remind you, that this looks very much <laughs> like what happens when we treat prions with the hypochlorous acid solution as a disinfectant, where again we change those prions. Um, and when this happens, they no longer uh, cause infectious disease in animals. So I also uh, wanted to look for how many prions are actually left in the dish when I change the cell's ability to produce these ROS disinfectants. And what I found is, again, it's the neutrophils with the higher ROS production that are really better at reducing the prion amount. So you can see the medium and high ROS, there's less prions left in the dish. Now, while these studies were working with human neutrophils um, that we were able to purify and work with within hours, I really wanted to look at uh, the production of these ROS disinfectants as it happens in the body because the immune system is highly complicated and how things uh, take place in the body is a little bit different than how it takes place in a dish. And so to do this, I'm using genetically altered animals that are unable to produce any of these hypochlorous acid um, ROS disinfectants. And I've injected these animals with prions, and I'm following them over time um, to see how quickly uh, the prions accumulate or 
possibly how quickly the prions are cleared. And this is all compared to a normal mouse that's also been injected with the same prions. Now, ultimately, we would expect if these natural disinfectants do manage a prion infection, then an animal that's not able to produce them is going to have a different um, time between the infection event and the onset of clinical disease. Now, while those experiments are ongoing, and it's actually going to be a couple months before we expect to see clinical signs of disease um, in these animal models, what I can tell you is that I do have preliminary evidence that indicates that this hypochlorous acid is produced in response to a prion infection um, in the brain of infected animals, and we believe that it's modifying the prions itself. So again, what you're looking at here is a slice through um, a brain tissue of an animal with a clinical prion disease, and you can see the prions in green, as well as a marker for these HOCL disinfectants after they've modified proteins there in white. And you can see that they co-occur. And so what this really suggests to us is that within the brain, uh, they're producing these disinfectants in a way that is modifying the prions, uh, presumably in an attempt to block the propagation of these uh, prions in brain tissue. And so, in summary, uh, what I've found thus far is that prions do activate these immune cells, um, human immune cells, to produce these natural ROS disinfectants. And the better these cells are at producing these disinfectants, the better they are at reducing uh, the prions uh, that they come into contact with. We think this process takes place in the body where we see evidence um, for these modifications on prions in brain tissue. And so experiments on, are ongoing um, in the mice, and we think uh, definitely early after infection, uh, there may be uh, small differences between the prion levels, but uh, we, time will only tell if this manifests in differences to clinical disease. Um, and with that, I'd really like to thank you um, for your time and the opportunity to speak today. Mm -hmm.